Hello again, physics friends. Um, we are going to do a fun little problem here uh, that allows us to exercise the time dilation muscle in our brain. Um, the nice thing about this problem, though, is not only does it help us work with time dilation and get used to time dilation, but it's also going to introduce the need for length contraction um, because we're going to show that in this problem, if we don't account for length contraction, we come up with um, we run into a paradox or a seeming paradox, um, meaning we get a disagreement, a logical disagreement. But once we account for length contraction, everything agrees nicely. So we'll use this example not only to practice time dilation, but also as a motivation for the existence of length contraction. And in a later video, we will come, we'll cycle back to length contraction and do uh, a derivation using symbols rather than numbers. Uh, okay, well... Right on, on this screen, I'm showing the problem setup and parts A and B. Subsequent parts will be on a, a later slide. Um, but let's just um, think through this a little bit. Okay, so our scenario is we have two clocks attached to a racetrack, the starting line clock and the finish line clock. Okay, and um, that's the, we'll call that the ground frame or the racetrack frame. And then we have Alice's in a rocket, and Alice's rocket is moving at high speed to the right. Okay. Alice has a clock on her rocket, and there's, again, two clocks in the ground frame. And um, Alice synchronizes her clock and the starting line clock so that when Alice passes the starting line clock, she sets her clock to zero, and the starting line clock is also set to zero. Okay. The first question here, part A, is saying, okay, in the ground frame, which is as drawn here, what is the reading on the right-hand clock? In other words, the finish line clock. Well, this one actually ends up being a pretty straightforward question because of the principle that clocks at rest have the same reading and show the same number. So in this example, the starting line clock and the finishing line clock are at rest because we're asked about those clocks in the ground frame, and that's the frame in which they're at rest. So if the left-hand clock is reading zero, then the right-hand clock has to read the same thing. So we can put that in. It's going to read zero as well. Okay. So we can move on to part B then. When, Alice's, when Alice reaches the right clock, the right clock reads 100 nanoseconds. Is the reading on Alice's clock larger, smaller, or equal to 100 nanoseconds? Okay, so let me draw a picture that shows this then. So I've just moved the original photo, the original picture rather, up here. Uh, this is the instant of the start of the race. And I've also drawn a snapshot diagram for the end of the race. We see that the starting line clock has not moved, the finishing line clock has not moved, but Alice's rocket has moved. And we're told what the reading on the right-hand clock, the finish line, finish line clock is at this instant. We're told that it reads 100. Okay. And we're asked, is the reading on Alice's clock larger, smaller, or equal to 100 nanoseconds? Okay, well, um, we know from time dilation that delta t at rest is equal to gamma delta t moving. Okay. So we first have to determine which is the clock at rest and which is the clock that's moving. And remember, we're in the ground frame. So the at rest clock is this one, uh, the finish line clock and the starting line clock. And we see the delta t is 100 because it started at 0 and ended at 100. So we have delta t at rest is 100 nanoseconds. And that's going to be equal to gamma times delta t of Alice. Right? Delta t of Alice is, um, used to be 0. The clock used to read 0, and now it reads something else. And that delta t would be the difference between those readings. But what we know, the important thing is that um, Alice's clock in this frame is the moving clock, and so it will tick less than the finish line clock. Okay, so here is the reading on Alice's clock larger, smaller, or equal to 100 nanoseconds. It's got to be smaller than 100 nanoseconds because it ticks less than the finish line clock. and they both start at zero. 
Okay, so we have answers for part A and we have answers for part B. And let's see what the next question is. Okay, so here are the next three questions. We're asked if now we're given a velocity for Alice's rocket. If her rocket moves at a speed three-fifths C relative to the ground, then what is the reading on her clock when she arrives at the finish line? How far apart are the clocks in the ground frame? And in the rocket frame, when the rocket clock reads zero, what are the readings on the ground clocks? Okay, well, let's take each of these in turn. Um, for part C, actually, uh, we largely did that already in the previous um, problem. We noted that delta t um, at rest equals gamma delta t moving. And in this frame, the ground frame, delta t at rest is um, delta t of the ground clocks, and delta t moving is delta t of Alice's clock. All right. And we're basically, in this problem, we're asked what is delta t for Alice. Uh, we know that delta t ground is 100 because, uh, so that we can say that delta t equals t final minus t initial. Right? I, the delta t is shorthand for change in time, meaning the ending point minus the starting point. And if we're talking about the um, ground clocks, then t final is 100 nanoseconds, and t initial is 0, so delta t is 100 nanoseconds. So we can put that in on the left-hand side. Now, how about gamma? Well, we know that v is 3 fifths c, and you um, this is a number we want to keep in mind. For a velocity that's 3 fifths the speed of light, gamma is 5 fourths. So we don't even need to do that calculation, right? But if we did, if we forgot that, we could always calculate it from 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. But we know that for v of 3 fifths c, we're going to end up with a gamma of 5 fourths. So we can just put that in. And the unknown is delta t Alice. So we solve for delta t Alice. And it'll be 100 nanoseconds times 4 fifths. 100 over 5 is 20. 20 times 4, well, that's just 80 nanoseconds. OK, and remember, that is t final minus t initial. That's what delta t means. But Alice's clock at the beginning of the race was 0. So t final, in this case, is equal to the change in time, which is 80 nanoseconds. So in part C, we can say that the final reading on her clock will be 80 nanoseconds. So we can um, come in and change this question mark. Or maybe we're not allowed to erase that for some reason. Okay, well, we'll just write over it that here it reads 80 when the race is over. Good. So we're now asked for um, how far apart the rocket, or sorry, how far apart the clocks are in the ground frame. Okay, so we want to know, we want to know this separation. And I'll call this L. Okay. So how do we go about finding L? Um, well, if we think about it, we know that the rockets, and this is again in the ground frame, where these clocks are at rest, the finish line and starting line clocks are at rest, and Alice is moving, we know that Alice started on the left side and ended on the right side, so she traveled a distance L. And so that distance L should be able to be written in terms of her speed times the amount of time that has gone by. So let's write that out. Um, so for part D, the distance traveled is L, and that's the distance traveled by Alice in the ground frame. 
and that's equal to her speed, the velocity of Alice relative to the ground, um, times the elapsed time in that frame. Okay, so we have delta t um, in the frame of reference that we're that is drawn. So that's delta t ground. Okay. Well, the velocity of Alice relative to the ground is three fifths c to the right. So the speed is three fifths of a foot per nanosecond. And how much time is elapsed? Well, we know that the ground clock started at zero, and then when she reaches the finish line, the ground clocks are at 100. So delta t ground is 100 nanoseconds. That tells us that what L is. Well, L is 100 over 5. That's 20. 20 times 3 is 60. So L is 60 feet. Okay, we're doing all right. We now know that the clocks are 60 feet apart in the ground frame. So we're almost done. Now we'll turn our attention to part E, which asks about a rocket frame analysis. And for that, we'll get rid of some of the earlier calculations um, that we don't need anymore, and we'll shuff shuffle things around so we have more space. All right, now that we have space, we're going to have to draw the scenario in the rocket frame, analysis frame, okay? Um, and in particular, we have the following. We have the rocket at rest. Okay. And we have the clock at the starting line and the clock at the finish line. And those are connected. Um, these clocks are moving because we're no longer in the ground frame, we are in the rocket frame. So what are the readings on these clocks? Well, we know that at the start of the race, both Alice's clock and the starting line clock read zero, and that's going to be true in all frames, because those are two clock readings at the same location at a given instant of time. Okay, But that does not mean that the finish line clock reads zero, because those two clocks on the racetrack are moving, and if two clocks are moving, they do not necessarily have the same reading on them. So we then need to know about the rear clock set ahead, right? We have two moving clocks. One of them is the rear clock, and we know that the rear clock is set ahead by L naught V over C squared, where L naught is the rest frame separation of the clocks. That's what we calculated in part D. So we know L naught is the rest frame separation of the clocks. And in that case, in this problem, that is 60 feet. Uh, v is the speed, or V squared is the square of the speed of the clocks. In this case, that's 3 fifths C, quantity squared. And C is one foot per nanosecond. So the RCA in this problem is 60 feet times three-fifths, oh, I've made a terrible mistake, haven't I? It's not L naught V squared over C, it's L naught V over C squared. <laughs> you probably caught that before I did. Um, so we just need one factor of V, that's three-fifths feet per nanosecond, and then we divide that by one foot per nanosecond quantity squared. Okay. 60 over 5 is 12. 12 times 3 is 36. Okay, and let's look at units. We have feet times feet divided by feet squared, so the feet's all cancel. And then we have 1 over nanosecond squared um, in the denominator, and 1 over nanoseconds to the first in the numerator, and that leaves us with 1 power of nanoseconds. So we have 36 nanoseconds. So the um, finish line clock, okay, is the rear clock. And it's the rear clock because in the rocket frame, the first clock to arrive is the starting line clock, and the 
second clock to arrive is the is the rear clock, <laughs> and that is the finish line clock. Um, so it is ahead of start clock, the starting line clock, by 36 nanoseconds. Okay, so it reads the starting line clock reading, which is zero, plus 36, which is a grand total of 36 nanoseconds. So the correct reading on this finish line clock should be 36 for the finish and zero for the start. Okay. Um, so this is all that we have for this problem, except we're going to use exactly the same setup in the next video to see why there's something that's a bit of a problem. And in particular, the problem that we're going to see is there doesn't seem to be enough time in um, Alice's frame, in the rocket frame, for the finish line clock to reach her and still have her clock read 80 nanoseconds. And what we're going to see is um, the reason for that is that although, although the um, racetrack is 60 feet long in the racetrack frame, the racetrack length is less than 60 feet long in the rocket frame. In other words, the track has contracted to a shorter distance. Uh, we will show exactly how much it's contracted and why it's contracted in a subsequent video. Take care, and we'll see you next time.